This is going to be a great panel and really the start to um, our day here. It's really nice to be with you all. Um, like Steve said, I'm Laura Makaroff. I serve as Senior Vice President for Cancer Prevention. I've had the great privilege and honor of being a part of the NCCRT for quite some time, even before my ACS days. Um, and it's just really always such a great meeting to come to, to be re-energized and inspired about the collective work we have to do. Of course, the, the climb is steep, the road is long, but being on it together really is, um, makes such a difference and we really are seeing such great progress. So it's great to be with you all. And today's panel is going to be um, informative and fun and we'll look forward to the presentations and then some great time for Q&A. So let me just kind of introduce and set the stage for what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, so this is about exploring innovations, successes, and future work to address timely colonoscopy follow-up to non-colonoscopy tests. You know, really, I think, in recognition that screening is a process and not just a moment in time, not just one test, but we want to have patients complete the entire screening process or, and or get connected into the specialty care they may need if there's a cancer diagnosis. And as you likely know, because I'm in a room full of experts, um, there's a growing body of evidence around the issue of delayed colonoscopy and how that leads to significantly associated higher incidence and mortality um, related to advanced stage cancers. So this is such an important topic. And at the same time, we're learning that timely follow-up um, rates are inadequate, and it's also kind of challenging to measure within any one health system. Um, so it's you know, just a, a challenge that we are all collectively working to address and learn about. You know, establishing robust links of care between screening, follow-up colonoscopy, so that's with primary care and GI and, and others, um, is so important and is really a big component of our 80% in every community strategic plan that um, um, Dr. Itzkowitz just shared. So this issue in particular is one of the roundtable's um, three priority areas. So this is part of um, addressing that priority area and being able to, to share some best practices, um, some lessons learned, and um, current work around um, this important topic. So we have a great panel um, set up here. Each panelist is gonna have about 12 or 15 minutes to share a presentation. I will introduce them each by just by name and where, they, where they're located and from. You can find their full bios um, with a QR code that's in your program, so I encourage you to take a look at that. We have some really, really talented and um, impressive uh, speakers with us today. And then we'll have some time for Q&A um, at the end. So up first is Dr. Rachel Osaka, who's a gastroenterologist and associate professor, and the Catherine Suris Smith Endowed Chair in Health Equity Research at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and University of Washington. So I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Good morning, thank you for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to join you to be part of this important conversation. So here is the title of my presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> here are my financial disclosures. So I'm gonna start by just sharing again, why this matters and why this is important. So here I'm showing you data from a meta-analysis that was done by Forbes and all, and it was um, published in 2021. And they did a systematic review meta-analysis of eight studies that had looked at this exact question around um, follow-up after a non-colonoscopy um, or a, a, a non-invasive um, screening test, and looking at time to follow-up and what that um, led to as far as implications for incidence of colorectal cancer as well as stage. And what they found was that across these eight studies that um, essentially when you looked at nine months, so if you waited nine months before colonoscopy was completed compared to one month, that the overall incidence of colorectal cancer, there was an adjusted odds ratio of about one and a half to 1.7 times greater incidence of colorectal cancer compared to a month, so again nine months. And then if you looked at stage, that when you compared people who completed their follow-up colonoscopy at one month versus nine months, that there was almost a three times increased odds of being diagnosed with stage three or four colorectal cancer once you passed beyond nine months. Um, 
And here I'm just showing you those kind of four, the four largest studies that were in this meta-analysis. In a separate study that I'm not showing here that was led by San Miguel and colleagues where they looked at um, VA data, they asked the question around mortality, like how long does it take if you've had an abnormal non-invasive stool test and not had follow up until you start to see CRC associated mortality. And that cutoff really happened at around 19 months. And so when you compared people who'd had follow up colonoscopy at one to three months to those who'd waited 19 months, there was almost a 50% increased mortality once you got beyond 19 months. So those are really sort of the benchmarks that I want you to keep in mind. And here I'm showing you a study, uh, a, a table of studies that have looked at um, how well we do when it comes to follow-up colonoscopy completion. Um, and so you can see the lead authors, the years these studies were published, the health settings, which are varied across FQHCs, VA systems, multiple healthcare organizations. And really the common theme you see here is that most of these rates are really between 50 to 60%, with some lower and some higher. Um, but that 80% aspirational goal set to, for us by the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer Screening, which is really what we should be aiming for, very few systems have achieved. So the next parts of my talk are going to occur in three phases, where I'm going to talk about the barriers to follow-up colonoscopy completion, interventions that have been published on this topic, as well as some work that our group is doing to address this issue. So when it comes to assessing the barriers related to lack of follow-up colonoscopy, I think it's important to consider the perspectives. And there are indeed multiple perspectives. So looking at level of care. So is this an issue that we are encountering sort of at the patient level, at the provider level, at the healthcare system level, or are there multiple levels at play? Um, looking at the methods by which this work is examined. So our folks looking at electronic health records, claims administrative data, are we using qualitative methods or are we using a combination of both? And then looking at the source. Is that information regarding lack of follow-up or the barriers to follow-up coming from a patient, from a healthcare provider, a navigator, or some other member of the healthcare team or community? And so I'm gonna just give you a smattering of studies that have looked at these different perspectives at different levels. And here is data from um, a safety net health network in the Dallas healthcare system. And here in analyzing electronic health records of a population that had abnormal fecal and chemical tests and looking to see who had completed a colonoscopy, they found that approximately 56% of folks had completed a follow-up colonoscopy within one year. And when they looked at the electronic health record, examining reasons why individuals had not completed a colonoscopy, patient-related barriers were the most common, so those are the things highlighted in blue. So patients either declined or they didn't show or they canceled after appointment was um, a colonoscopy colonoscopy was scheduled. System-related factors were about 22% of the reasons, and those are highlighted in um, green. So again, um, there was something that was sent to the GI team that was not acted upon, or the pre-op um, visit wasn't scheduled. And then you see the provider-related factors accounted for about 18% of the barriers, again, in electronic health records. When we look again at electronic health records, and this is a large integrated health system in the Midwest, and what they did was they compared individuals who had had an abnormal fit um, to folks who'd had an abnormal multi-target stool DNA. And they looked at the provider listed reasons for why there was lack of follow-up. And I really just want to highlight one, which is that this um, tendency to attribute an abnormal fit to other reasons when folks completed a fit test that you don't see um, as prominent when patients completed a multi-target stool DNA. And this, in this particular study was about 24% of the reasons why providers had not referred patients for a follow-up colonoscopy. And we see this over and over in different studies. Um, next, I'm showing you some work that we did in the UCSF safety net healthcare system, where again, over a, a prolonged period, only about 56% of individuals with an abnormal fit went on to get a colonoscopy within one year. And you can see that there were multiple steps sort of in this um, cascade to colonoscopy in which patients were lost to follow up. 
And this is a similar finding to work by um, Dr. Gloria Coronado's group, in which they also looked at FQHC network in the Seattle area. Again, you can see that about 90% of people were referred to gastroenterology after having an abnormal fit result, but by the time there was a pre-visit, um, a pre-procedure visit required, there was drop-off, and by the point of colonoscopy completion, only 43% ultimately went on to complete their colonoscopy. So these multiple steps required for patients to get from an abnormal fit to a colonoscopy in both of these scenarios was in fact detrimental to follow up. Um, here, I'm again showing you some work from Dr. Coronado's group in which they did qualitative interviews. So these were telephone interviews with patients in community clinics who had had an abnormal fit, again, assessing reasons why they may not have completed a follow-up colonoscopy. You can see that when you look across both groups, the most common barriers were fear and anxiety over the procedure, and then also lack of assistance in scheduling the colonoscopy. But when they further broke this down by language group, Folks who spoke Spanish said that their main barrier was cost or lack of insurance as the reason why they didn't complete follow-up, and that also there was lack of concrete information for them that described the procedure, um, whereas English speakers were more likely to cite lack of transportation. So again, getting at, you know, there are different barriers for different populations in different health settings that we need to be cognizant of. And then in our own work where we interviewed providers in a safety net healthcare system, we found that the barriers associated with follow-up colonoscopy from the provider perspective was really lack of transportation and cognitive factors, so the bowel prep, fear of the procedure um, for patients. And so what I want to highlight is that regardless of the perspective, there are three main themes that emerge when you assess barriers to lack of follow-up colonoscopy. So there are the logistical barriers, including the multiple steps to colonoscopy and lack of transportation. There are financial barriers related to lack of health insurance or out-of-pocket costs that individuals experience. And then there are personal barriers, so fear of the colonoscopy or concerns about the bowel prep. So these really seem to be the areas that we need to be able to address in order to reach the largest group of folks to get that follow-up test done. So next I'm going to talk about interventions for follow-up colonoscopy completion. And you will notice this section is very short. So. Here I have summarized and added to work that was done by Kevin Selby, now published in 2017, where he did a systematic review of studies that had been done asking what are the interventions that help improve follow-up colonoscopy completion. And what I want you to recognize here is one, that the numbers overall are small, right, across the board. When you look by level, so whether it's patient level, provider level, or system level, when you look at randomized control tests, those numbers are even smaller. Um, and really the patient sort of navigation st uh, studies are the ones that rise to the top as showing promise for helping to improve follow-up colonoscopy completion. Um, there was some evidence that perhaps multi-component um, quality efforts were um, useful in observational studies, but there was difficulty disaggregating the effects of those individual interventions um, in these studies. So I wanted to also kind of look at, specifically within safety and FQHCs, where we know a lot of patients use these tests, to understand what are the interventions that have been tested um, and, and documented in those settings. And here I'm showing you really only five studies that exist that have asked this question in those settings. Um, and so you can see that they use different study designs, only one randomized control trial, pre-post, three retrospective studies, again, mostly all looking at navigation, um, when you look at the intervention for follow-up colonoscopy, so after navigation, that follow-up ranges from 46% to 79 or to 84%, depending on the setting. Um, and then you can see that there isn't always a pre-kind of comparative group, but there's evidence that that when you look at the before and after, that it could be anywhere from about 6% up to 20, um, about 21% improvement. So this is in fact promising work. So what are some of the innovations for follow-up colonoscopy completion? So here I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the work that our group is doing. And so we had used mixed methods to identify that lack of transportation and or chaperone were important barriers to follow-up within our safety net healthcare system in Seattle, Washington. And we had hypothesized that rideshare non-emergency medical transportation platforms such as Uber and Lyft could potentially be a scalable and cost-effective way to increase colonoscopy completion for those who need follow-up. 
And so we had two aims to this study, it was first to identify the barriers, facilitators, and the process recommendations to implement a rideshare program for these patients who had received sedation, and then we wanted to pilot this program in our safety net population. And so we engaged an informal stakeholder um, kind of uh, walking meeting tour, where over a one-year period, we had about 22 data collection points from 34 individuals. Um, we, and you can see those listed here, they range from patients all the way up to the state healthcare authority. And in this process, we were finally able to align on being able to use this intervention for follow-up colonoscopy completion. We finalized the contract between Lyft Healthcare and our healthcare system to execute this intervention. And so this is data that's a little bit older now because it's the, um, we recently expanded to another site across our health system and enrollment has been going up really quite dramatically. Um, but to date, 44 patients have consented. Um, this data I'm showing you, 39 people had completed um, rides. Um, so again, these are people who've received sedation and are then using this to get home. The majority are men, primarily speak English, 50% identified as white. The others, um, you can see the racial breakdown there. And then 18% identified as Hispanic or Latinx. Um, you can see that the majority are covered by public insurance that most actually lived within 30 minutes to the healthcare system. Said that they use public transportation to get to their appointments, so it wasn't getting to the appointment that was the issue, but it was the getting home part that was challenging. Um, for this data, the average cost of each ride was about $24. The average distance was about four miles, and the average length of the ride was about 14 minutes. And this is all data that we can extract from the rideshare platform that's sent to us on a monthly basis. Um, when we then interviewed patients, because our, our primary outcome for this pilot was actually safety, because as you can imagine, there were a lot of concerns around what happens if somebody doesn't make it home, if they fall, if they pass out, et cetera. So we said safety would be the primary outcome. And so patients are interviewed afterwards, all 30, and they're actually tracked as they're going home as well, which is an advantage to using these platforms that you don't have when you release a patient to whomever is picking them up. So all 39 patients have gone to their destination safely. In the post-ride interviews, uniformly, everybody said that they would use it again and they would recommend it for others. They keep calling us, trying to use it for other procedures and we have to keep reminding them <laughs> that we only have IRB approval for this indication. And the key barriers that the program helped address according to patients was access to the procedure. So patients said that they wouldn't have had to reschedule or canceled if they didn't have this. And that they appreciated the autonomy in their care, that they didn't have to rely on anybody else to do this follow-up. And so here are just some quotes um, from patients that have really you know, compelled us to do this work um, that we do. So in conclusion, follow-up colonoscopy is typically between 50 to 60%, although there are outliers on either side. Failure to complete a follow-up colonoscopy is associated with increased CRC incidence, increased late-stage disease, as well as CRC mortality. There are barriers at multiple levels of care, but the most consistent ones appear to be logistical, financial, and personal. Interventions to date are sparse, especially in safety net health settings, and they often focus on a single level of care and that we really need innovative multi-level interventions to address these multiple barriers to care to move the needle forward in this persistent challenge. So i like to acknowledge our funding sources and the teams that help us do this work, and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Rachel, for kicking us off. That's uh, great. I hope you're all writing down your questions for the Q&A portion. Um, up next, I'll just move us right along, is Dr. Jason Dominitz, who serves as the Executive Director for the Veterans Health Administration's National Gastroenterology and Hepatology Program. Thanks. And I'm also uh, based in Seattle, but I have to go to Houston to see Dr. Asaka. She, uh, she did a great job giving us the foundation on, the, you know, the background on this issue. Um, I want to thank the roundtable for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of the work that the ASGE is doing to address gaps in the screening continuum. The ASGE is uh, the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. It has nearly 16,000 members around the world, including gastroenterologists and allied uh, healthcare professionals. And the mission is to advance patient care and digestive health by promoting excellence and innovation in GI endoscopy. 
Now, as you just heard from Dr. Asaka, the rates of colonoscopy after abnormal non-colonoscopy screening tests like FIT and FIT-DNA are not where we want them to be. They're in the 50 to 60 percent range, and that's not just in the uninsured or underinsured. It's also in insured patients, as you'll hear more about from Dr. Siemens in the next presentation. And we know that this impacts outcomes. You heard about this from Dr. Asaka. The graph on the lower right is from Italy showing that people who comply with colonoscopy after an abnormal fit have half the mortality, that's the green bars, half the mortality of, compared to those who do not comply with colonoscopy. So the ASG has embarked on a project to try to address this problem. And there are four goals. First, to develop a financially sustainable model to ensure that uninsured and underinsured patients who have an abnormal stool-based test get timely follow-up colonoscopy. Second, they want to develop a roadmap to help patients navigate this screening continuum from beginning to end, including the follow-up uh, colonoscopy and treatment if needed. Third, we're working with uh, programs in Georgia and Maryland to have uh, pilot projects for education, navigation, and outreach. And finally, we want to work with uh, lawmakers to educate them on the need for funding for addressing this problem. So some of the key outcomes and deliverables. First of all, we want to increase screening in underserved communities to reduce the time to that follow-up colonoscopy after abnormal stool tests, to get a better understanding of the barriers that Dr. Osaka was just talking about, to work on metrics to help us assess how we have sustainable programs and develop a playbook of best practices that can be shared, and then finally to work on prototype legislation for sustainable funding. So here are the, some of the steps from phase one. There's three phases to this project this year. It's around building the foundation, and so it's still a work in progress. Uh, we're working to identify sites in Georgia and Maryland for the pilot project. Uh, there were summit meetings in June and July in Georgia and Maryland, working with legislators and other uh, stakeholders on this. They're working to develop partnerships with hospital-based and private practices to get those follow-up colonoscopies done and working on uh, communication processes around patient navigation, getting primary care and GI groups involved and other stakeholders, and finally working on the metrics for this program. So the sites that will be chosen for the pilot project need to have an established colon cancer screening program with a track record of working with uninsured and underinsured patients. They need to, divide, to have a process for getting colonoscopy done, either through charity care or emergency Medicaid, and work with gastroenterologists either in private practice or at hospitals to perform those follow-up colonoscopies. In phase one, there were the summits I mentioned already. They're in the final stages of selecting those uh, pilot sites in Georgia and Maryland. They're finalizing those workflow processes and the educational resources. And then we had a nice summit meeting in August at the ASG headquarters. Dr. Asaka was there, as were several other people who are in this room today. There were about 50 uh, folks representing advocacy groups and uh, different organizations uh, around the issue of colon cancer screening. We had lectures from uh, leading subject matter experts, including Dr. Asaka and uh, some others that are in the room here today, to discuss best practices in how to increase screening and timely follow-up for uninsured, underinsured patients. And then the, the results of this meeting, a summary of the meeting, will be published in an ASC journal, hopefully in the not too distant future. Some of the takeaways, I think the most important one for me at least, was that we need a quality metric. We talked about the HEDIS measure. You saw Dr. Um, Itzkowitz show the HEDIS measure for colon cancer screening rates, but there's no one really tracking the rate of this colonoscopy after an abnormal stool-based test. And I think if we track that metric, it can help us move the field, move that needle. We need to have strong relationships between the various stakeholders, including GI groups, PCPs, advocacy groups, and others. We need to talk about what is the word to, uh, you heard me say follow-up colonoscopy, Dr. Iskowitz used that term as well. People talk about diagnostic colonoscopy. Some say it should be the required colonoscopy after an abnormal fit. Maybe that term is too strong. But what word would resonate best with patients so that they would know that really we want to get them in for that colonoscopy? So uh, this was one of the discussion points at the meeting, and I, I think the people around this room probably have lots of ideas on this, and we need to come up with a term that makes sense that will work to get those colonoscopies completed. And then we need to really minimize that time from abnormal stool test to colonoscopy. 
And we need to get the payers to come up with a way to support that navigation. You heard from Dr. Asaka about how navigation really does increase that follow-up rate. That's really the best proven strategy at this time, but nobody pays for it. Now, as we move into phase two of the project, there'll be community outreach to identify patients to get screened, and there's grant support to provide the Cologuard test to 300 uninsured or underinsured patients in Georgia and 300 in Maryland, and they're going to collect a variety of uh, data points along the way, and the costs for that care will be covered through the grant. Here are some of the data points that will be collected. I won't go through the whole list, but as you'd expect, patient demographics and the process measures around the dates of the test being ordered and shipped and processed and the results and the result notification, et cetera. Also looking at the um, follow-up results, the patient's colonoscopy data, uh, the time to colonoscopy, the pathology outcomes, the quality of the colonoscopy, and, and the patient navigation process. You know, how did the navigation work? What were any of the barriers? You heard about the importance of patient transportation issues. That will be assessed as well. As we move into phase three, data analysis will be uh, undertaken, and there'll be advocacy for state-level funding to ensure that patients with abnormal stool-based tests who don't qualify for public assistance or Medicaid have access to timely follow-up colonoscopy. There'll be work on developing a playbook or best practices to share with other states and the plan is to have a summit around 2025 at DDW, the big GI meeting at Digestive Disease Week, to review and evaluate the project outcomes and to work on strategic communications programs through social media, et cetera, to promote the uh, key findings and encourage other states to have comparable policies. Now, this effort is led by Dr. Jennifer Christie, who is the president of the ASG and chief of GI at the University of Colorado, and a great team of individuals uh, who have been working on putting their thoughts together on how to move this project forward. So the key takeaways, we all know that follow-up colonoscopy, diagnostic colonoscopy, required colonoscopy, whatever we're going to call it, doesn't happen as often as we think it should. And we need to find better ways to get those colonoscopies done. The ASG believes that this project is important. It will help save lives. So keep your uh, eyes out for uh, communications from the ASG, and we welcome your input and suggestions. Thank you. Thanks so much. It'll be exciting to follow along and, and see what we learn from that project. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clemens, um, who's Senior Vice President of Research and Analytics at AMGA. She's going to share with us about some ongoing work with 20 health systems across the country. Um, so my, my daughter just went to her first national conference, and she's in college. Um, and it was a Society for Women Engineers. And she said that the sessions that stuck were, with her were those that told, were funny and told jokes. Um, and it just kind of reminded me that, of this urology conference I was just at. And I just have to say that, you know, they're still really number one. And <laughs> we're just going to have to be settle with being stuck with number two. <laughs> and we're off. Um, I'm going to talk about... <laughs> <laughs> colonoscopy follow-up rates, predictors, measurement, and learning collaborative insights. Um, that's pretty much it in my title. I'm going to um, whip through all those. American Medical Group Association. Um, we are a nonprofit uh, trade association, and our members are healthcare organizations, so multi-specialty medical groups, um, integrated delivery systems, academic medical centers, a few FQHCs. And we advocate for our members. We do quality improvement, like things like colorectal cancer screening and other prevention and chronic disease management. And we conduct research. Our members are in all 50 states. And we have data from some of our members, which are the green dots, which um, helps uh, facilitate our research program. These are some of our members. We have over 400 members. And they end up caring for one in three Americans. Um, so I'm in the research, I lead our research department, and really what we're trying to do is just get evidence into practice for our members and with our members. So I'm going to start with the, the study that um, both the previous speakers mentioned, um, and it was uh, uh, published last January on colonoscopy follow-up rates, and we just wanted to look at what, were the, what are the rates and what factors were associated with follow-up. So uh, you just saw this slide, but um, we found overall on average that 51% uh, 
followed up within six months, but you can see that there's a lot of variation there. So all those thin lines are all of the 39 organizations. So that means that there is, we can learn from those higher performers, but there's also a lot of room for improvement. So follow-up rates were lower among black and Asian patients. They were lower among um, Medicare and Medicaid patients compared to commercial. Uh, they were lower um, for those who received a FIT test versus a multi-target stool DNA test. And they were also lower for those who had higher mortality risk um, based on the Charleston com comorbidity index, so more comorbidities, higher risk, um, less likely to be screened or to follow up. Uh, we also interviewed uh, primary care providers and leaders from five health systems, and so a couple themes that came out of that is just that lack of knowledge about uh, failure to follow up. So um, everybody was surprised at how low the follow-up rates are, and we know that's because they're not tracking it and they don't know. Um, patient hesitancy, we have talked about this. Uh, we know there's discomfort with the PrEP, and we do know there's a solution to that, that well, a somewhat solution, that there are PrEPs that are easier to take, like the over-the-counter Gatorade and Maalox. We talked about that at the ASG, ASG meeting. Um, and then cost. So even though, uh, so when we did this, it was prior to the 2021 change that took, um, went into effect in 2022. Um, but we still learned uh, recently, I learned that there are 13 health plans that are exempt from that. So it's so, still something we have to think about, and maybe some of the policy folks here can talk about how we can address that. And then we know that um, provider recommendation is still uh, super important, and, and that's who patients trust. So some facilitators that we learned about through these interviews, um, the, from the patient level, having that, doing that anticipatory guidance um, when given the stool-based test, making uh, referrals easy. These things all sound easy to do, but we know these are the gaps. Reporting, transparent reporting, having a dedicated staff, which might include the navigators that we've been talking about, and at the system level, um, integration into the EHR and coordination with GI. So in summary, uh, for the, this study, we, uh, about half, of, a little more than half of patients did not receive a follow-up within six months. Black, Asian race, Medicare, Medicaid, FIT, and higher mortality were significantly associated with lower follow-up rates. And then after looking, accounting for all those patient-level factors, when we compared all the different health systems, there still was significant variability. And the low provider awareness and lack of tracking um, could potentially be due to a lack of quality performance measure. So the next thing we did was work on a quality performance measure. Um, so the, we did this in collaboration with, with this group and American Cancer Society and CQA with funding from AARP and, and Optum Labs um, to develop a, a follow-up measure. Um, we had some advisors, three of them are in this room. One of them is, I guess, super famous now. We heard all about him, um, but uh, great help. So the measure we looked at was uh, we looked at a year of eligible patients who had a positive fit and then um, six months for the follow-up. And this is just the description in writing. So I'm not gonna share all of the, the results that we looked at, but one was reliability. And um, so this, what this means is when we um, looked across the categories, in this case, the healthcare organizations, um, there was 96% reliability, which me means that 96% of the variance in the measure was due to between system differences, which is what you want. You don't want it to be due to noise, you want to actually have it be due to the differences. So the summary of the measure development and testing that we did is that uh, our follow-up measure, I think we actually um, called it, and we submitted this for publication, a completion measure, just to the a point from the last speaker. Um, but we're still, we can still talk about what it should be called. Um, but it's, it meets the criteria because there's variation, it was reliable, and it was feasible. We tested it independently in three different health systems um, with three different EHRs just to see if they could get, gather the data needed. And it passed the face validity by our four national expert advisors. Okay, and so then, after that, we uh, decided to kick off a best practices learning collaborative. 
Uh, so what is that? It's really a, a mechanism for shared learning run by our, um, our foundation and John Kennedy from our, uh, who leads our foundation is here as well. So we have a national advisory committee. Uh, we do outreach and coaching. We do site visits. Um, very importantly, measures and quarterly benchmarking. So we develop measures. So we are essentially testing um, the measure. We're testing that measure that we want to develop into a full-blown quality measure right now among the 20 groups. Um, the QI reporting is everybody tells us what they're, what they're working on, what interventions, we provide resources, um, webinars, meetings, et cetera, and it's all um, uh, grounded in health equity. So these are the 10 or 20 participating health care or organizations currently in the collaborative. They're spread out around the country. Um, and this is just how big their uh, active patient populations are, just to show you that there's variation in size of the groups. So we have one very, very large group, um, and then um, a, a set of medium size and some smaller groups. But uh, when we look at our data, we usually do a group-weighted average, so that, that one group isn't kind of taking over. So the uh, measures that we're looking at are um, up, being up to date with CRC screening, um, then gap closure in each quarter, and then uh, follow up after an abnormal um, test or positive test, and that's the one that I'm gonna focus on now. We also have a health equity component, so every system uh, has identified a population that they're gonna focus on um, within their system, and they're um, implementing interventions to target uh, those groups, whichever one they have chosen. And then all the measures are being stratified by age, race, ethnicity, sex, and insurance as a proxy for income. Uh, so the, the one that I'm just going to uh, quickly share the results with is the follow-up measure, which looks as you would expect, except that we are um, looking for follow-up in 90 days uh, because it's a collaborative and we want to see um, results faster, so we need for, uh, more frequent measures with shorter intervals. But from our previous work, we found that anyone who got a follow-up in six months, 85% um, of them had gotten follow-up within 90 days. So we can do that conversion um, when you want to think about this and compare it to some of the other data. So this is the data across the 20 groups for the follow-up measure. So the top section there is the, uh, that's how many patients there were. So you can see the numbers get small when you're talking about patients who had a follow-up, I mean a positive uh, or abnormal um, stool-based test. And then the range on the bottom, uh, you can see the average is 37%, Oh, and the patient weighted average is 47%. So that translates with that, um, if you want to think about it, for six months, the overall 47% would be about 55% in six months, and the 37% would be about 43.5% at six months. So lots of variation, but um, fairly small numbers. And that's the baseline. So we are um, just getting data in, and we'll be looking at it quarterly. So. Soon, next meeting, some other meeting, we'll be able to share um, the progress. And uh, this, I just want thing to emphasize are the kind of the number of colonoscopies that need to be done to meet this measure. So just to walk you through this slide, on the left side, that tall blue bar, those are the total colonoscopies performed for screening in this collaborative. So about 55% of all the tests done for the initial screening were colonoscopies, about 45% were stool-based tests, or a very small percent, something else. Um, so 72,000 tests were conducted for screening. The next bar, the avocado bar, um, is the number that you would need to get to 100%. If every patient who had a um, abnormal stool-based test got their colonoscopy, that'd be 8,000. Um, to reach a goal of 72% for 90 months, which is the same as 80% at, uh, at, at 90 days, at six, um, would be 80% at six months, we'd need to do about 5,800 tests, and we did almost 4,000 tests. So we only need 2,000 colonoscopies. Just like, that's not a huge number that we're trying to get to of, if you think about all the colonoscopies being done. And it's only a 3% increase in the total number of colonoscopies or a 3% shift in the colonoscopies to prioritize follow-up. So just when you think about numbers, it's not, it, it's not overwhelming, even though there are barriers. So these are the planned interventions um, for 
the follow-up measure. So 11 of the 20 groups um, are, are planning and right now actually putting into practice some kind of intervention for follow-up. So um, they kind of fall in these different buckets, whether it's tracking and really importantly um, is the tracking of the measure and transparent reporting because nobody's doing that currently. So that is huge, but there's other pieces. So they're working on access, they're working on improving referrals, improving the identification of patients with positive tests, and then that timing. And um, I sort of put in blue just to show that many of these have to do with collaboration with the GI department. So whether it's empowering GI to track the patients, um, letting when a PCP is notified of a patient, the GI department can be notified at the same time. So these are all the things that our um, 20 groups are trying out. Um, and then two others, these are my two favorite. One group is gonna identify the best performers and spread it across the region. So looking, you know, this is our, we call it our positive deviant approach. So really looking at who's doing great and learn from them. And then one other group says that they're gonna do data exploration interviews. They're really gonna to try to understand the why among their own patients. So why are their patients not following up, try to study patterns in the data um, and successes and failures. So we'll hope to be able to continue to update you as we, as we move through the, the collaborative, um, but it's, it's really exciting. And that's it. Thanks so much, and thanks for making it Fun. I said this would be a fun panel, and so you helped to help make that happen. So I appreciate it. That was a, a great joke. I'll file that one away. Maybe we all can. Um, so um, last but certainly not least is Dr. Michael Pignone, who's a professor of medicine in the Duke Department of Medicine. Um, so he will share with us for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll um, have some time for Q&A. So get your questions ready. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, really a pleasure to be the anchor leg in this amazing relay team. So uh, I'm going to try to take us down the home stretch and uh, and get to the questions of the audience. And um, thank you uh, for for the opportunity. I just moved to Duke for the last seven years. I've been chair of internal medicine at Dell Medical School, and the work I'm going to talk about today is work that we've done in, in Central Texas. And I want to acknowledge my close friend and uh, collaborator, Dr. Kieran Shokar, um, who's been a great partner in this work and as we both do it in Austin and build it out across the state of Texas. So that's the reason for the burnt orange still on there. I'll get some Duke blue maybe for the next time. I also want to acknowledge the American Cancer Society, which supports me through uh, my clinical research professorship. And then the work we're talking about here is funded principally by the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas, which I've acknowledged here, um, in addition to the ACS and the CDC, who's been a long, long-term supporter um, of, of my work. So um, when you saw the slides that Rachel presented originally, if you noticed there was one of the higher performing studies with Scott et al. That's the work I'm gonna talk about today. That's our work um, from, from Austin. And uh, we've approached it with an equity lens. So I'm gonna talk about how we've um, you know, developed a process of achieving high rates uh, after positive fit and how we've, in doing that, in developing that systematic process, also approached it with an equity lens so that we really tried to make sure that we were doing it equitably in a, federally qualified health center that is very diverse, whose patients suffer a number of different challenges and inequities, um, you know, in addition to the baseline hard task of getting this um, follow-up accomplished at a very high rate. And if I'm successful, hopefully we'll have some insights that will be useful for other systems. Um, You've already seen this. I don't need to say this again. I mean, everyone's done a really good job um, of explaining what the problem is. Um, I'll tell you about how we approached it. I'd just say as a parenthetical thing, I don't think we actually need a whole lot more research about the problem um, or the whys. Um, we know what the problems are. Um, they're multifactorial. No single one accounts for the low rate of uh, follow-up. So it's really to me about like tuning interventions and we approached the work that way. We relied on the great literature that existed about barriers. We did a little bit of looking into our own barriers, but when we put together this work, um, we had a couple of advantages. So one, through the funding of the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas, we were able to both offer free mailed fit 
and importantly, no out-of-pocket colonoscopy costs for, uh, that was principally for uninsured patients. So that's one of the differences between CPRIT's implementation work and other implementation work I've done before this where you're still faced with the problem of paying for the test for the uninsured. Because we worked in a very diverse um, system where about a third of the patients are Spanish language preferring, we emphasized developing fully bilingual materials that were culturally tailored and appropriate and were written at a low literacy level in both English and Spanish. And then really the core of our program is our bilingual patient navigator. Uh, the principal person who does that work, Heisel Herrera, will be here. She's speaking tomorrow, so if you want to hear more about the nuts and bolts, please come to her session. And then just a shout out that you really, you know, um, as I think every speaker said, you need to have integration with GI care to make this most effective, and we've had a great uh, relationship with our GI department led by Dr. Deepak Agrawal. So this is data from when we started the program in 2017 to 2021. Um, I'll talk about what's happened since then towards the end, but this covers a period of time where we had about 370 positive fit, and we were able to get 271 completed. Um, we also reported 90 days, and the 90-day number I don't have on the top of my head is a little bit lower than the ever colonoscopy, but our median time was 55 days. So um, you always want it to be lower, but seeing some of the data, you know, today just kind of reinforced to me this is this is actually pretty good. And when we published this paper, and the first author here, Rebecca Scott, um, was a medical student. She's now a resident in our VA-based program. I'm going to have to get her attached to Jason because um, she's doing great work as a primary care resident now. But as a medical student, she published this paper, um, presented it at the Society for General Internal Medicine, and then published it in JGIM. And basically what we show here is that we were able more or less to ensure high rates of colonoscopy after positive fit. Remember, the base was 72%. So you can see um, in kind of the middle column the percentage by the number of different demographic variables. What stood out to me is that we are less likely to complete colonoscopy after positive fit for older patients, right? Those rates are in the 60s, so there's a real um, opportunity to close that gap. Um, but what was particularly important to me was we didn't see lower rates of completion uh, for our Hispanic or Latino patients, which represent about half of our total patients in the practice. Um, and if anything, our Spanish language patients actually competed their positive fit at a higher rate. So this made me feel good that we were um, at least not creating language or ethnicity-based inequities, and maybe, if anything, um, showing that we could achieve higher rates. And then, to the point I made earlier, the line in the payer called MAP, that's the Medical Assistance Program, that's essentially the county-based um, program for uninsured patients, and those patients completed at about the average rate, and the people that are truly uninsured, who didn't even qualify for MAP, completed a little bit higher rate. I think that really reinforces the importance of moving cost out of that kind of, you know, different overlapping barriers that you showed earlier. Moving cost was, was a big part of that. So, a um, couple things before I get to the conclusion. So, I showed you this data that, you know, kind of was the first four years of our program. I think, you know, a couple things I just want to reinforce. Number one, the navigator was essential to this work happening. Uh, she really made sure that um, things didn't get dropped. You saw all those different places in the process where there can be a voltage drop. And I think navigation actually addresses a number of different barriers, both in kinds of personal motivation and understanding, reinforcing you know, how to do the prep, things like that. But more importantly, making sure that things didn't get dropped in scheduling and in moving through the different um, parts of the process. I think there's still an opportunity to reduce the number of steps. So um, what we need to do is work with our GI uh, colleagues to see about can we remove the pre-colonoscopy visit. I think in certain settings, yes. For many patients, yes. But we also have to be careful about, you know, other things happen in that visit to reinforce the importance of it, and you don't want to lose that. So can you do it by telephone? Can you do it by more reinforcement from the navigator? I think, I think you can. Um, and then, you know, the, the other challenge that we faced in Austin that we were able to overcome through a navigator is disconnected systems, right? So each one of our systems, um, GI, um, surgery, oncology, and primary care 
essentially we're operating in different health systems and a number of barriers of care, particularly for underinsured patients. So um, I think we were able to overcome those, but that took a lot of the navigator's work. So particularly, I think, for um, FQHC systems or other systems that have highly vulnerable patient populations, that role of the navigator becomes um, you know, even more essential. And in our setting, it was really important that person be fully bilingual. You would think our health system would be, because it has such a large Spanish-speaking population, would be already kind of language friendly, but that's not necessarily the case. So the navigator really made a big difference in that space. Uh, we're gonna keep working on our problems with age-related disparities. Um, and then recently, uh, the importance of ongoing data monitoring. So recently, we actually had a, um, a, a drop off in our um, fidelity with time to colonoscopy so that people were slipping into the 100 to 125 days. And that's getting out at the level, as you can see from the prior data, where it starts to be, well, you know, are we, are we potentially affecting outcomes? So um, just putting on the QI hat, you know, we just got into this thing where we were scheduling everybody out at six months, and you just can't do that. When you schedule people out for six months for a colonoscopy, the chance that they'll actually keep that appointment really starts going down. So this is kind of basic QI 101. You gotta work down the backlog, you gotta reduce the queue, and we've really tried to reestablish um, a goal of getting people in for the pre-colonoscopy visit within two weeks, and you know, to colonoscopy within two months. And if that seems hard, I'm like, well, what's happening while you're waiting for them to come in at three months or six months, right? right? There's no point once you know you need to have the test other than just the logistics of organizing your help, um, you know, who's gonna go with you to the procedure, things like that, to wait that long. And I think that's the spirit you have to approach things with if you really wanna keep the times down and not just be like, oh, we're out at six months, oh well. So um, just to conclude, this is our, our team. We have an amazing uh, multidisciplinary team doing this work. This is at the uh, Oak Trees right next to the uh, med school campus. And it's just been a, um, a real pleasure to help build and work with this great team. And I you know, really look forward as um, I make the move to North Carolina for Dr. Shokar to continue this work in Austin. And then as she mentioned yesterday, um, spreading this work throughout uh, the state of Texas in our next kind of CPRT funded initiative. So thank you and I look forward to taking questions along with the rest of the panel.